Kristen, this is my wife, Kristen, who again is a therapist. She's going to introduce herself in a minute. We've been uh, married 25 years um, in January 4th, so uh, that's exciting. But uh, we support each other in in our uh, uh, professional and, and personal pursuits, and we both have a, a passion for helping uh, individuals um, get well um, and in both mind, body, and spirit. And that's what we refer to as reconciliation, restoration. Um, and we, we uh, take that team approach in, in treating um, in both our, both of our areas. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna, uh, but that involves a strong uh, counseling component uh, uh, behavioral health management, which may involve uh, psychotropics, it may involve just medicine, general medicine, which I'm going to deal with, and then um, in family involvement. I'm a just big believer in getting family involved in in, in recovery mm -hmm. processes, um, and then of course uh, restoring spiritual health and making people feel welcome back there in the church and reestablishing community um, and relationships. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Kristen, to introduce and get let know a little bit about your background. Sure. I'm Kristen, and I um, fell into this area of substance abuse counseling about 18 years ago, and I started to work with people who had been court mandated uh, to uh, to get some counseling and um, and hopefully avoid jail in the process. And so I, I I love that area. And about two and a half years ago, I started my own business. And it's called Step Up Counseling, and I work with people uh, in the justice system. And my clients have DWIs. They have uh, they were on in on possession charges. Some of them have been selling drugs, and most of them um, it's not their first rodeo. They've been in multiple times. So um, many of them have both mental health and substance use uh, disorders. And so trying to get them the help they need. Uh, simultaneously is very difficult. Um, I'm a social worker. I got my master's in social work. And so I was trained from a systems perspective. I like uh, looking across organizations to see what can be fixed uh, because there are flaws in the system. Um, most of my clients are uninsured. So trying to get them residential treatment or psychiatric care uh, can be very difficult. Um, so advocacy is a big part of my job, uh, trying to help people navigate the system and not fall through the cracks. And you'll hear me say that a couple of times. Um, this fear of having people fall through the cracks really drives me in my work. Um, it's my passion to get people back to the, the table, uh, so to speak, um, when dealing with some of these stigmatizing problems. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, I, I recently just spoke to a, a mother um, who had lost her son to overdose. He, he died from his overdose and um, tragically from heroin. Um, and when the, the mother said to me, she said, you know, you know Jonathan, um, he got well, he got, he got sober. He, he never got well. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he died from a, a death of despair. Um, and um, it's something that try to communicate is that you know, sobriety is, is not recovery. There's that recovery is about getting well. And, for, and again, from the medical perspective, uh, just how do we get healthy? And that means addressing, you know, medical issues, both with their, with their body, but, uh, and then getting healthy, um, but also with their brain, which um, in our circles, that, that may require, again, physicians interventions, and then spiritually getting healthy. And uh, I mean, prior to our meeting, Chad and I were just talking about that a little bit too, is just how, uh, and Kristen will exp uh, expand on that a little bit about just where we're able to talk about this freely uh, mm -hmm. among Christian circles and community groups and in your church, right. um, which is a, a big deficit. Um, mm -hmm. And it, uh, it, it's hard when people are uncomfortable uh, going to church or saying they're, they don't feel like they, they can go yet. Mm -hmm. And that's our job, no matter what you do as part of this network, you don't even have to be a, a professional counselor or, or in the medical field to, to communicate that, that idea. Um, because um, chemicals like alcohol or heroin or, or even actions like suicide, they're, uh, they're these mm -hmm. major culprits of death and despair and hopelessness. Um, and so often you'll hear people say, oh, they're being dumb or they're being selfish. But we need to realize we're actually they're injured mm -hmm. um, and they may be, they're coping inappropriately and possibly trying to run or escape but um, it's, a, you know, heroin's a mocker, you know, uh, Xanax is a mocker, you know, the, 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 the pill mills are a mocker, we, weed is a mocker, wine is a mocker, I say. So at the core, addiction to this substance 
it's a it's a misguided response to a desire, um, and desires are rooted in need. So, um, so as a physician, and when I meet patients, even on initially, is I just say, you know, I just here I'll discuss what I've seen work and not work, and um, and then personally, I'm still always learning and growing, and there's not a uh, a uh, a blueprint model that we just stamp on everyone. Um, and you have to meet individuals um, and new patients uh, and know their individual stories. And that's what makes humanity unique. So um, Kristen, do you wanna expand on that? Sure. Um, so like Brian said, I mean, being able to hear someone's story I think is very powerful. Um, and I have a unique perspective. I'm not only a counselor, I've been a client. So I've been on both sides of the desk and have had to navigate the system for um, my own mental health needs. And so that's created a real passion in me for creating safe spaces, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in our churches, uh, like Brian said, in our small groups and Bible studies um, for, for people to be able to self-disclose. And uh, one of the reasons people don't, and one of the reasons it's so stigmatizing is that so many people have a, um, a characterization of mental illness as like the guy under the bridge who's talking to himself. And that's sad because these are so prevalent. These disorders are so prevalent. Um, one in five people in any given year are experiencing a mental health condition. Uh, one in 17 have a major mental illness and over a quarter of the population has struggled with depression. Um, so it's sad to me when people again fall through the cracks um, because there are a lot of us who can who can relate. So I think not being afraid to self-disclose, uh, being able to talk about the benefits of medical care, professional counseling uh, within our churches. And, um, you know, I think churches can be a first line of defense for some of these problems. Uh, some people will tell their pastor or small group leader things that they wouldn't necessarily go to see a counselor for. And um, so it's there's an opportunity there, uh, I think, for uh, for churches to be educated on how to um, how to capture some of these people. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also a risk because I think the message that some people hear going into a church is that um, pastoral support and prayer is is enough. And uh, it's often not sufficient, uh, just as somebody who's, you know, experienced, um, you know, many benefits from the, uh, the professional care system. Um, I just want to emphasize that point that although I have been, uh, I've experienced a transformative power of prayer, um, it can be dangerous um, to not address a, a, a need, a, a mental or substance use need. Um, especially because those needs can worsen over time. So, you know, small problems are easy to treat, big problems harder to treat. So there is a sense of urgency there and getting people connected to resources, uh, getting people connected to the, um, the uh, system that can help. And personally, I don't believe that a referral is enough. I like to uh, make a connection between um, the, the, the person who, who's in need and the, the provider um, and, and follow up then and make sure that uh, that connection was made and the help was received. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's so key, and that's one thing that uh, Kristen's a, a great advocate for is just making sure they follow up because so often, and even in, in, in church circles and things that they'll it's it's you know a quick drop by, drop by, say hi, and then there's not the follow up, and that's the stuff that takes takes work. Right. Um, and again, you don't have to work in that field to do that, but the follow the follow up is key. So they um, and uh, just learning what compassion is. Um, mm -hmm. We often I'll have patients that be like, well, I'm uh, I'm I'm too old to to start this. I have just a couple of weeks ago, I have a 75 year old methamphetamine heroin patient that I take care of and still follow up, and he's healthy. But it's uh, you, you will get people who think that they're they're too far gone medically, or they're they're too old, or they're beyond repair. Because often I'll talk about you know how how the brain is damaged from from substance use, and we'll get images of their brain, and people get all nervous and say, well, I've you know done permanent damage to my brain from their use, and maybe they have, but uh, what I do say is uh, neurobiology is not destiny, mm -hmm. and be, you can just as much as someone who injures their leg and does physical rehab to overcome 
things that may not work uh, to people who have head trauma to, from motor vehicle accidents to military, you can, you can go around those things and you're utilizing other things. So you don't want to uh, set them down this pathway where they feel like they can't be healed. And, and right. that especially applies in, in, in spiritual healing too. Um, and you're never too unhealthy to restore or reclaim. And mm -hmm. that's, a little bit, uh, Chad, what you and, uh, and Eric were talking about a little bit beforehand is just making, again, making that acceptable to be able to go to that where people feel like I have to have all my stuff together before I can yeah. work on my my spiritual component and healing. Right. And that's the job in the church is to, to help them feel accepted. Right. And sometimes spiritual healing is not going to be the absence of the affliction. Um, God may not take the affliction, but he's going to be with you in the, the struggle and his presence is enough. And I think we need to communicate that message as well um, because healing can happen on many levels. And you know, one thing I like to point out, Brian had mentioned compassion, is that the root word of compassion really is with passion, uh, which means with suffering. So it means to enter into someone's pain and suffer with them, um, which, and that can be hard to do. I think many people are uncomfortable with those kind of feelings in somebody else and maybe even in themselves. Um, so getting in touch with your own brokenness and your own pain um, helps you to relate to any number of problems. I don't have to have the same problem as the, uh, the addict I'm counseling because I'm aware of my own powerlessness and my struggle with shame. Um, so I think, you know, whether it's undergoing a, a, a process of counseling or um, journaling, um, listening prayer, meditation, uh, those kind of things can get us uh, to be more comfortable. And the more comfortable we are, uh, the safer the space uh, that we can create for somebody who, who is struggling. And I have been a small group leader, a Bible study leader. I've planned retreats. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about creating those safe spaces. And I think it was Brene Brown who said, you know, two of the most powerful words somebody can hear when they're struggling is me too. And so being able to make a connection, that person doesn't feel so alone. They don't feel so marginalized. Um, and uh, so I think those are powerful moments. And those are moments that I try to create uh, in the small groups that I lead with clients and in the small groups that Brian and I lead at church. Good, yeah. Um, and just uh, in talking about surrendering, because I'll have people come into treatment and they're like, I'm going to try harder this time. Yes. And um, it, I, I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to try harder. And, and, and it's, not, it's not about trying harder. It's, right. a, it's about surrendering and laying it out there. I mean, um, and when they were able to do that, to be vulnerable, um, addiction can lose its power when it's exposed, mm -hmm. but it's just being comfortable, uh, reveal, being revealing, but addiction steals, addiction kills, addiction destroys, mm -hmm. and it, and it feeds that shame cycle. And, uh, there's a, a wonderful speaker. I need to get him to come speak on here too sometime, Eric, uh, uh, but Alan, but he'll say, uh, he'll say, look, if it's, if the disease doesn't kill you, if the substance doesn't kill you, it's that it's the shame yeah. that, that'll, that'll kill you and destroy you. And, um, and it's just that part of that, getting that willpower and the weakness and the failure, the guilt, the shame, it just goes right. round and round right. and round. Right. Um, and that, and then they'll start listening to that voice, just like mm -hmm. somebody who's trying to lose weight or trying to do any habit. Why should I bother? Why should I try and just right. want to give up? I mean, addictions derived from the word it means enslaved to bound to. And that's something I also try to communicate is nobody wants to be a slave to anything. And that can be very freeing. And you'll hear people when they break this, they're like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I can't believe how much time I was spending on this. And you talk about the, the freedom we're going to have the, the, uh, and, and not living that double life, which again, feeds into that whole shame cycle. Right. Um, so um, you want to talk a little about restoration work? Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things I was going to say uh, in relation to, to surrender, surrender is a very spiritual term and my clients don't necessarily um, all have spiritual beliefs. They've been burned by the church mm -hmm. they felt judged by Christians. And so many of them feel on the outside looking in. Uh, on faith communities. So, um, so they may not all be ready for AA or NA, but they may be able to relate to the concept of surrender. And I just like to point out, you know, addiction is not a, a, a failure of effort. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think there is a, a, a message out there and in some counseling approaches, the message certainly is uh, try harder. And um, I grew discouraged with that, with that message over the years of counseling that I did, I wasn't able to fix myself. So it wasn't until I told God, um, you know, I can't do this myself. You're going to have to help me um, that he's able to enter in and start doing some of that healing work. 
Um, so, so again, kind of, uh, kind of embracing some of those spiritual concepts and, uh, and, and also um, helping people to, to not feel judged, to feel our compassion. It's all about grace. You know, um, Brian and I love this speaker, Brennan Manning, who says, you know, we have to accept people where they are because, and as the, as they are, because none of us is as they should be. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think just being able to relate to some of that struggle, um, that, that life is hard and, and we all need a helping hand sometime. Right. Um, yeah, because I'll, uh, in trying to equate uh, recovery, whether it's mental health recovery or behavioral health, but also an addiction, it, they need to you treat it like a chronic illness because um, we've made great strides in medicine in regards to chronic right. conditions like diabetes or heart disease. Um, but that's because we're saying, okay, you know, Eric, you need to follow up with your endocrinologist. You need to take your insulin. You need to follow up and, and watch your diet and health. But unfortunately with addiction, especially it's um, we, we, there's not that compassion and especially from family members, like, why can't you stop? Right. Don't you care? Um, and then, and for the patient, they may think, well, I just treat this like a 30 day illness or a 60 or 90 day mm -hmm. illness. And until you treat that, it, it's a, it's a lifelong recovery. And for those in recovery, they definitely get grasped that concept. Um, and, but it's uh, that, feeds into that shame cycle. And so my job is a, I try to educate nurses and, and other healthcare professionals because no doubt my profession has contributed to people ending up in, in facilities, whether that's just throwing pills at them, but also um, not asking the right questions. And um, I think uh, spiritual growth and, and, and just growth and just getting to know people, it's about asking questions and and listening, which yes. we're all in a culture of, we want to have an answer for everything. Yes. So that that um, it leads me to uh, just a couple of things I want to talk about, a couple helpful approaches that I feel um, can be beneficial, and you really don't need a degree to practice them. Mm -hmm. um, one is this uh, concept of uh, motivational interviewing, and uh, you can use that in many different settings. Um, I use that primarily as my approach with uh, court-ordered offenders because they come in with so much resistance and, um, you know, they feel like they're being forced to change. So just meeting them where they're at and giving them a respectful space to work through uh, those questions, you know, do I have a problem and, you know, what can I do about it or, or uh, what has it cost me and like, what does it cost my family? Um, those are the kind of questions that, that you want to ask. And I think of motivational interviewing as the art of asking questions. Uh, we can all become better listeners. And uh, one of my favorite quotes is that, is that wisdom is the reward for a lifetime of listening when you'd rather have spoken. And so I think sometimes, um, again, you know, asking people questions, giving them space to, to struggle on their own uh, can be really helpful. And then another approach that I find helpful is um, Kurt Thompson in his book, Anatomy of the Soul, which Brian and I really uh, like. Um, he talks about feeling felt, um, which is, it is a felt experience. You know it when it's happening. Uh, it's about somebody enter, entering into your experience and being able to, um, to relate and, and just to show you that you're not alone uh, in your journey. And so I think that's a gift you give people and it doesn't have to just be clients. It could be the people in your life, the people in your small group, in your church, uh, is that experience of entering in with them. Um, we're all so busy and distracted and uh, so it can be rare. And, uh, and think, I think it's something worth practicing and even training uh, church leaders to, um, to practice. Yeah, no, that's perfect, well said. Um, and also just people who are that are in recovery or in much further along, they have to realize that how, how long that took as well. Like, so um, it, it, that can be frustrating from the patient standpoint too, if they feel like they're not where they're supposed to be. Right. And that applies to uh, you know, medical conditions too, that they just want to be able to jump forward. Um, so I always, uh, tell my patients to, uh, to check their own pulse, kind of figure out where, the, they, where they are at that point and helping individuals realize what their capacity is um, and, um, and try to be uh, open and with, you know, open with their thinking and not what I refer to as closed door thinking and uh, finding, 
finding things that, that hold them back and you, know, you could call those pot, potholes or pitfalls, but that they need to, uh, because their brains for those who are long-term addicts, for example, with alcohol, that brain gets trained in the thinking it needs that alcohol. Right. And so the uh, relapse rate, typically yes. when you talk to people and say, you know, when did you relapse? Often from a medical standpoint, they'll often say weeks, months, you don't, you know, you'll have people that can relapse on these substances, you know, 18 years later type of thing. But majority of the time, that's because they've chemically made changes from their substance and their brain thinks and their body thinks it needs that substance. And so those are hard chains to break away from. And that's typically why you'll hear people that's when they, the, the, they'll talk about how you know, the first year is so difficult. And with time, you uh, that's, restoration work happens with time and right. but that's a hard message to carry along and say this is going to get better this is going to get better and right. all the more reason they need a good uh, church community a faith community to, to help them help, help them along right and you know people ask brian and i well how do you not get discouraged you know the rate of relapse is very high and mm -hmm. it can be a revolving door we do see the same patients over and over um, but I, I use um, kind of a different perspective. It's called the stages of change model. And so if I can get someone to move from not realizing there's a problem to being able to consider uh, the possibility that there's a problem to being able to even think about doing something about the problem, I regard that as a success. Uh, relapses can be learning opportunities. Um, and, you know, you want to intervene, of course, in that process. Um, but sometimes preventing those learning opportunities uh, ultimately backfires uh, in some ways and not not strengthening the individual to to handle the adversity that is part of life and they are going to have to experience real world problems so uh, we can't protect them from that and uh, so just being with them as they as they go through that process that recovery process is is important good yeah um some uh, another way i'll talk about it analogy is just like with the with the, with the jigsaw puzzle that you're not going to just grab the pieces and start right in the middle of uh, the nature scene you're going to find the corners you start with the edges and that's how you're going to build up and i, I always like like that analogy and then finding people's windows to their soul and uh, and uh, figure out what what uh, motivates them because if the uh, the recovery approach if it's just they're going to white knuckle it and just i can't i can't i can't i can't it, that ultimately they need to that, take a more of an offensive approach and find where they're uh, filling those voids and, and dealing with those difficult issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it, in a, as a physician in addiction medicine, um, it is one of the very unique areas of medicine where I can openly talk about spirituality and faith and recovery and mm -hmm. mental health and physical health. So it's a very rich area of medicine. And I encourage people who are still exploring avenues of what they want to do in the medical field. I, I definitely tell them it's one of the few areas where you can pretty openly talk about spirituality and faith. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's a uh, and, and, and learning about grace and learning people's stories, mm -hmm. which is uh, so it's a very rich field to be in. Yeah, it is. Um, and one of my, I, and I think, you know, one of my faith beliefs and one of the things that uh, drives me in my work is the, uh, the belief in just the essential dignity and self-worth in the individual. Uh, God created us all in his image. And I feel like, um, you know, that should reflect in the way we speak to people, especially people who, um, you know, in certainly in my case have been judged and, uh, you know, found to be lacking, um, but I think part of what healing involves is getting people back into community. Um, mm -hmm. They have felt marginalized and on the outside. And so um, being able to, uh, to invite them back into, um, you know, uh, just relationships, really um, not feeling ostracized for their problems, because I do believe that healing happens in the context of relationships. So when you're alienated, you can't heal. Uh, there's just not that um, that interaction really, and you can't be uh, the hands and feet of Christ if you're not there with the person who um, who is is suffering. So um, I just encourage us to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty. And um, you know, I've I've worked with within homelessness and um, and in trying to uh, again get people who have both mental health and substance use disorders the help that they need. Uh, so there's a lot of problems out there and it's not just for government ag agencies or uh, professionals with degrees to try to solve. Um, I'd encourage you to, uh, to just find your part in the solution. All right. Um, 
another and I you know where uh, when we work like you said we have a, a spiritual track a journey journey program and and people will say if when we invite them if they want to be part of that they'll be say well patients may often say I want to have a relationship with God but but I'm not there and uh, being accepting and say well that's okay my prayer can be for you to want to want to have a relationship with God if they're not there and yeah. so they don't ha have to be uh, perfect there and right and again that's a, a, a message that we, we try to carry over um question i'm often asked is kind of what would i want to accomplish with them under while they're under my care and that's getting the patient to be honest get totally honest mm -hmm. um recognizing right. their uh, defects but also their defense mechanisms and that mm -hmm. that takes courage um and communicating that you know this disease it can and it can kill you it will kill you if you don't and again if you don't desire die from the disease itself it's that shame and guilt that'll squeeze the life out of you mm -hmm. so um and that um getting people to recognize their their barriers to recovery and and um and helping them get well um, and learning that uh, uh, illusions are the stuff that they can live by and just getting really honest. So, yeah. and God's going to hopefully strip away those things, but also um, uh, just reveal uh, and, and be able to, to grow and be the complete person that God intended us to be. Right. So, and that's a, and the and all through the message of grace. I mean, I think that's where I've gotten the most success through that, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And I think if you look at the 12 steps, I mean, that's some of the hardest and most courageous work you can do. And a lot of uh, pr principles of Christianity are, are embedded in the 12 steps. You've got uh, confession and uh, reconciliation and, um, and then asking for help and, and surrendering your, um, your struggles to God. So uh, I think, you know, instead of uh, feeling like, oh, it's AA or church, you know, we can do both and certainly celebrate recovery has been a good, uh, good avenue for doing that. Um, but it's unfortunate. I think that some of our clients would rather go to AA than, than church. Um, but I don't think it has to be either or. I don't know, Eric, did you want to add anything with that, that part too? And you don't didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I know that's something we've talked about before too. Oh, your mic's off. There we go. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there is actually a, a page on our uh, website, the Spiritual Care Network website for resources on uh, groups like Celebrate Recovery and even other belief systems. Um, so it's, it's interesting if you go to spiritualcarenet.org. Um, I know there's a few other uh, new groups stemming from Celebrate Recovery, like uh, Regeneration and Restoration. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I, I believe at Starlight, we follow the curriculum for Celebrate Recovery. Is that correct? Yeah, that option, yeah. And then Drew James and yeah, in, the, in that group, the Journey Program. So, yeah. Awesome resources. Oh, any comments, Chad? Whoops, you're on mute, too. Oh. <laughs> you got us both. Uh, I think it's so insightful because having been a pastor in the church, there's so many that suffer in silence. And it's so important that we in the faith community create a safe space for individuals to share and to be vulnerable. I know because most people, the shame and guilt, just people cycle in and out so much and they don't really get their needs met. And uh, I'm the presentation was absolutely amazing. I'm still digesting a phrase, couple of phrases on it. And it's like, that is so good. But um, I, that safe space is so, is so important. And uh, that's just, it's so needed. I mean, that's what, that's what Christ would have done. He was open and he was honest. And he always wanted people to be real where they're at. Because I think you have to face it before you really can face it. And I think that's where the church is really getting it backwards. They faith it before we face it. Yeah, well like said. That. Yeah, well said. <clears throat> And I think what you said, um, Kristen, which is, uh, I hope I can do it justice when you talked about healing doesn't look like you healing is like fix, it to me. I'm getting work fixed. Yes. Yes, exactly. And so much in Jesus and evangelical Christianity, we're about, we, for those who are evangelicals, who have that persuasion belief, salvation instantaneous, you're changed. And so we get focused on complete. We're done. And if you're not walking it perfectly, walking this thing, then you're not measuring up and you're not in relationship or you're not in connection. And then that cycles people down because there is no relationship and growth without security. And so the church needs to provide that secure love and acceptance because that is the only place where we truly can grow. 
Right, right. And it That's is hard. It is hard. I think sometimes the messages communicate, well, if you pray about it, then then God's going to take that away. God's going to take away your suffering. But sometimes he's just, I'm not just, he's going to be with you in the suffering. And that is the healing that you're going to experience. And I think it can be disillusioning, you know, to go into a church that's, um, you feel like, well, God's not listening to my prayers. He's not, you know, answering me. What, what's wrong? You know, what did I do? And so I think you really have to be careful what message you communicate uh, when people are, are really struggling with some of these issues. Yeah. And, and I like that, the, the power of the prayer. Um, and, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to use the Q&A box. We have a few uh, in the chat box mm -hmm. too. But I wanted to ask, um, what are your thoughts on the power of prayer, especially using it in therapy? I know that's tricky because a therapist has to be can non, you know, non-biased and and there's lines, right? right? How yes. do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I think um, you know, praying for my clients certainly has a, a, a big place. Um, you know, like I was saying, some of my clients have felt burned by the church. And so, you know, to ask them if I can pray with them, there's gonna be some barriers there. Um, so again, if I can, you know, inch them along and, and even change when I was talking about seeing change from an incremental perspective, you know, not an all or nothing, all of a sudden I'm, I'm there, you know, if, if we can just kind of inch them towards, um, being open to do some open to doing some of those things. I think that's, that's great. And that may be the, 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 the success in the, you know, the, the counseling relationship. Yes. I even had one therapist that said, she loves to pray with them, but she has actually has them sign a little agreement that uh, first. So, that, so I don't know. <laughs> this is another way to look at it. Right. And I mean, Chad, you were just made a reference from if we're in an evangelical circle, you we have to remember some people connect with prayer with silence, mm -hmm. meditation, yes. maybe going on a walk. And so one thing you can ask is, how do you connect with God, right? How do, how do you connect with Christ? Really and so, and not, and not because we do, we get look. I'm guilty. We all get in our kind of here's the way I connect, or here's the way, mm -hmm. and, and they're, uh, get very formulary in our faith. And we all know God's way bigger than that. The and look, I mean, the the mystery of faith, and and there's yes. things that we're, we're, we don't understand, and that uh, but find that how they connect, and that can go from how they get well medically too. Mm -hmm. So, individualizing treatment, but also individualizing yes. their relationship with Christ. Well, Lizette does have a good uh, question here. Uh, I assume it's for you, Dr. Davis. Uh, what are your thoughts about the use of medications for cravings in addition to therapy? So, um, and of course, there's a, and that, that's something we have to try to educate people, whether to, to, not to be afraid of medicine. It's, it's just mm -hmm. like, we're like what Kristen was saying, oh, you, know, you need to pray more, do these things. I'm like, it's okay, God. God gave us medicines yes. and, and, and it may be a very temporal thing. And so I am not opposed to whatever's going to help them. They may need bridges. And when, cause I say, when you get out of here, walking back out, you got to realize the alcohol person, they're walking out and there's bars that give you a free, you know, it's sick. They give you a free drink for your 30 day recovery chip. That's real. Yeah, That's sick, but that's real. And, and so it, they're going into battle. So if there are tools that can help that give them a shield, a sword, mm -hmm. a helmet, by all means. Now, again, if we find that they're interfering with the recovery, but, but I'm not opposed to medication assisted treatment at all. And, it's, and then especially if you're, my best friend has schizophrenia. Um, my best friend's married and he lives in St. Louis. He has a job, he has a family. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't take his schizophrenia medicine, right. gosh, can you imagine? And 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 he has a and faith, but so there. That is a hard question, though, is you know because people will ask, they're like, "Am I bipolar? Am I schizophrenic?" And I'm like, "I don't know. You've been smoking crystal meth for five years, and I don't mean to make light of it. It's just like teasing that out. But it's okay. We're going to use things that we need to help you get well. Right. Right." And I heard, if I could add a point, I heard my pastor say, whether it's medically or spir spiritually or miraculously, God did it all. Because yes. God used all our gifts, whether it's medically or miraculously, God's in it all. Yes. That's yes. Good. Well, Barbara, like I'll say this on one of the comments. Barbara Hall just said, when she's speaking about prayer and, and God, she says, I don't say God to my clients. I say the word love. Sometimes. Ah. That's a unique way. Yes. Barbara, thank you I like that. that. <clears throat> Because God is love. Right. 
ask another question. Uh, we had another comment uh, or kind of a question. I had, I've had some clients tell me that they're afraid to replace a drug with another drug. Sure, and um, so, and that's you know kind of expanding on the last question as well. And so now I, I'm an I'm an addictionologist, so I'm not going to you know have you know my what I'll tell them is look I'm last thing I want you here is addicted to anything. So um, and we're I'm very careful when we do that in indi individualizing treatments, but. Um, I will also say, look, the hypertensive person may need a lisinopril or a, a beta blocker, and, that, right. and that's okay. And they, um, but by all means, you want to talk to your physicians and people who are in recovery or mental health. They're like, oh, well, they're gonna, the doctor's gonna judge me. Then I'm like, well, you need a different doctor because you need yeah. a doctor or therapist that understands brokenness and recovery right. and mental health and addiction. But um, you know, I don't know if I directly answer that but yes we're going to be you want to be very careful not to cause another issue and what i'll communicate is that it's this may be a temporal thing you may only need right. this because i talk about the brain being imbalanced and it's not a magic number of 365 days but the brain if for someone a long-term user it takes about a year before you can mm -hmm. kind of get closer mm -hmm. to that homeostasis and that's not a magic number there because it's all dependent on what they were using, how long, if there's an accompanying mood disorder that makes different people's hills steeper, or, you know, less steep. Right. And um, just whatever's going to help them achieve sobriety and wellness. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, let me uh, throw a question at Chad um, as a former pastor. And I know you work with a lot of churches in the Mid South. Uh, what are some of your thoughts and recommendations on uh, for faith leaders to adopt uh, more of a more programs in the church for mental health and addiction or reduce the stigma. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, it's imperative and a lot of it comes with messaging and understanding your, and being more relatable. Uh, sometimes our pulpits become just very much just speaking on doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. But I think Jesus is doctrine but it has to be walked out and coupled with grace you know the bible talks about mercy and truth have been met together righteousness and peace have kissed each other and we walk in and teaching people how a church is how to create those spaces and cultures of acceptance you know and realizing that jesus was attractive to people who didn't believe in him the sinners or sinners or the lost were interested in him and they weren't ashamed. They wanted to be around him. And our churches need to be a place where people who don't know Christ or don't know the faith want to be there. And that means the addicted, the broken, the hurting, the sick. Our churches need to be a place and reminding pastors what their mission is. And so I just think before programming, I think we got to get to our heart issues and deal with the atmosphere and the culture because if you have a program and have the wrong culture, your program's not going to work. Right. I've done a, I've done a celebrate recovery one time at our church, and I'll be honest with you, it didn't work. It lasted about four months, and I can I know Dr. Davis can tell us this, but a good group, if it's not led right, it's not going to be a good group, and it's going to die. So I think the churches and faith leaders, we got to work on our heart and our culture, and work on that first, and then programs will start. Heart before program. I agree. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's where you're really gifted. She's really gifted at facilitating and not, like you say, just being up there talking. So, um, and, and really getting, cause look, as a believer, my favorite believers to be around are people in recovery mm -hmm. and they're working or, or a doctor's dream. Hey, I want to get well, but he, what you see is what you get. I'm not deal with right. it, but I'm broken and I want to do well and I want to be healed. And I need, I need God. And those are my, like I say, selfishly in this, in my uh, uh, occupation, I, I, I get fed off of that and it, it, it's, it's rich. And that's one of the things about working with people in the legal system is they kind of have to get up there, give up the game. You know, they've been busted. Mm -hmm. And so wow. they come in and it's like, well, you know, it's kind of rock bottom. And so uh, they get to start building from the way up. You really don't have to break down a lot of defenses uh, with people who've been revealed, really. Well, don't y'all, I'm going to ask a question, Eric, if that's okay, but don't y'all find it, and y'all can to anyone really, 
that we're people are attracted to our weaknesses more than our strengths. You know, because strengths sometimes can intimidate others, but when you share yes. weaknesses and you're vulnerable, like Brene Brown, being vulnerable, right. people are attracted, don't you think? Is that right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's almost contagious, I think. And I think if our churches, I mean, if our pastors shared more of their weaknesses. Like, oh, I did battle depression or I did have an addiction. Right. I think I think Max Lucado one time confessed that he struggled with alcohol at one point. And we, okay. you know, and that was like, wow, I can relate to him. Yes. Yes. And it's, it takes a lot of guts because oh. there's, you know, it's, it's, there's no guarantee that you're going to be, that message is going to be welcome. So, yeah. you know, there is a risk of being judged, but it's a risk worth taking yeah. if you are drawing people back into the congregation who have felt like there's not a place for them. Yeah, good point. Uh, we do have a few comments here uh, about uh, medications, uh, maybe a little bit about uh, MAT uh, using Suboxone. Uh, someone commented, uh, many report that the detox, uh, on Suboxone is actually worse than heroin, or that's what people think. Uh, what does our toxicologist and our addictionologist think about that? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, a, a bit of a loaded topic, but I mean, the standard of care is using, utilizing medication assisted treatment. Um, in my experience as an addiction person, I think a lot of people get, uh, information from blogs, you need to be careful. I, I don't believe it's as, as severe as, um, as you know, heroin or things like that. I think people forget, but they're, they're, you have coming off of medicine, it can even be a psychotropic as simple as a, a Paxil nice. or something. You, you have to taper appropriately. And so you don't want to just wing it and get on blogs. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's my issue with the whole uh, weed industry as well right now and the THC thing. I think there's just, it's the wild west. And mm -hmm. I think you need to um, consult people who have expertise and training in these areas. And, um, and um, I get it. You're, you know, your the individual is going to know their body, but by all means, you want to do things that are safe and not have a, a rebound effect or that could cause them to relapse or worse, you know, make their mood, you know, mood disorders worse. And that's yeah. such an issue with so many drugs of abuse, but, um, and that's, um, unfortunately people are self-medicating a lot too. They may just be trying to medicate uh, a mood disorder that they can't get well. And they're just doing that with their, their brain. Um, but as far as um, I, I utilize Suboxone, there's even a place for methadone and as bad as methadone can be. I mean, I've seen people that could not get well and that's what they had to do. And it's a, that's a horrible hard drug to get off of. Um, and why do we have it at all? Well, I mean, it's, it, it, no doubt it reduces the spread of HIV and hepatitis and um, but by all means that's a harm reduction and that's a uh, nice. it's a uh, it's a hard uh, question to navigate and it involves the individual and even their uh, their loved ones in, in making decisions. Yeah well and then there's also the the stigma in the church too and and um, I think people forget that the person in the pew next to you could be struggling with an addiction and it could be the housewife that gets hooked on Adderall or somewhat an athlete that gets hooked on opiates for pain. And, and uh, you know, it's not just, I've had actually churches insinuate that well, we don't really have those problems in our congregation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good question. And yeah, and I, and I mean, it, it's, uh, there's, not a blanket answer you have to individualize but it, uh, you're going to want to be very careful if you already struggle with an addiction issue right. with, with things that are, have potential for abuse so mm. um and, or dependence but um but getting them moving forward and that's where the follow-up and treating it like a chronic disease and a chronic condition is mm. imperative hey doctor did you answer the question is someone asked the question is it worse coming off suboxone than heroin, and heroin? I, I, I mean uh, now i personally have not come off of those uh, oh. but i i do i do not believe of course you read blogs and they say oh it's horrible horrible you just have to taper properly but gotcha. but no i don't believe in and not near as dangerous and um it just has to be done properly now if you abruptly stop it like at a high dose you're going to you're going to feel it like you do a heroin for sure so mm -hmm. um it just needs to be done under medical supervision and care and, and, and properly and it can be done. Well, and speaking of medication and, and uh, we had the conversation what, last week about the fentanyl and how so many people are overdosing and, and it's just because of how they're making it, correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, it all has people 
come in when I'm screaming. Your sound the, went out for some reason. Uh, is it on now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that uh, they'll come in and say, well, I, you know, I just abuse pills. You know, I'm not doing heroin. And and I'm like, gosh, I mean, the pills in the street right now, there's so many uh, things that are pressed improperly or stressed out. And I mean, they're, you're trusting, you know, cartels or, or your drug dealer who are, who are parasites. I mean, I had a, a patient come in the other, uh, just a few months ago, not the other day, a few months, and he said, oh, my drug dealer sent me to treatment. And, um, and my comment to him was, it's because the, the tick doesn't want the dog to die, right? You know, he, you know, he, he was going to lose his business, he, you know, so type of thing. And, um, but it's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I, mean, I don't know why you'd want to, to, to kill off their, 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 their people, but I think there's, uh, you're trusting drug dealers and overseas things and, um, and getting pills from the street is extremely dangerous. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah, we had another comment about uh, using uh, vapes uh, for the drugs. Yeah, so vapes can be, uh, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, there's just so many things in the, of course, young people, but they can be adulterated and you can put all kinds of things in these things. And, um, you know, well, is it better than smoking? Well, the problem with these vapes is they're just, you know, they're attached to your, your body. And so you're just people are vaping around the clock. So you don't see a huge drop in uh, their their intake and if anything it's uh they may be even doing more but and the more concern is just the way you can put other substances in these uh in right. the vapes um, especially with the young people whose brains are still developing awesome well i just put in uh, two links one is uh the starlight program that is our christian based program so if you click on that you can get more information uh for people that would like that faith based program uh, in treatment. Also, I'll put the spiritualcarenet.org um, link on there if you would like to be on the database to get emails about um, other uh, webinars or meetings in your area, or if you'd like to join, uh, go to the spiritualcarenet.org. So well, it looks like we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, any last comments? <laughs> for my, for my, um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity uh, yes. to speak and uh, to a very important topic. And uh, yes, yes, um, yeah. And I think you know the word "we" is a very powerful word. So when we're talking about this, you know, it's we struggle with this. We not it's not an us them mentality. It's we're all in this together. Hmm. Yes, um, which is the whole point of the spiritual care network is to bridge that gap between mental health and faith. Well, I love that segue. That was perfect. <laughs> So thanks again, Kristen and Dr. Davis, for joining us today. Uh, great information uh, that we could use when we're talking to our clients or family members or people in our churches. I appreciate that. And, and good seeing you, Chad, from Tennessee. Thanks for co-hosting today. Thank you, guys. It's a pri privilege to be on. Thanks for your awesome. Well, you all have a, a blessed holiday, blessed Christmas, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.